Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort and creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. This is going to be a little different because we're both kind of going to be talking about a creep. You'll be talking about him a little bit. I'll be talking about it a little bit more. It's one of the most litigated crimes in American criminal history. This guy is a huge douchebag. And I can't oh my wait. God, I hate him. I can't wait to go into it. But let's just go through the rigmarole that we always do yeah. at the top of the show. We have a basic Facebook page, but we don't really check it that often. That's just a place for people to complain about our language. Fuck yeah. We use salty language in this program. We have a private Facebook group. You do have to answer three little questions in order to get in. Or if my finger is slippery and I just hit you okay without you doing that. (laughs) Happens occasionally. But it's just to keep the private face group private and safe. It's just a place for us to hang out and vent and talk about creeps. If this is all new for you, what we do is we pick a creep every episode, then we end the episode with someone who is not a creep, so you don't go away feeling like uh, the world is just completely falling apart, even though it kind of is right now. (laughs) Not to bum y'all out. I I don't know why I laughed. I laughed because I'm crying. I'm crying. It's funny because it's true. (laughs) We are on Twitter at CreepPod because somebody had what a creep for 10 years and never used it. Creep. You can find us on Instagram, What a Creep Podcast. We have a basic old timey email, What a Creep Podcast, spelled it all out at gmail.com. If you would like some stickers, I'm going to do a whole batch soon. Send me an email, shoot me an email with your address. Also, that's a place to communicate with us, give us your ideas for creeps and also non creeps. We are always looking for those kind of suggestions. Mostly mm-hmm. we get them in the Facebook group, but those other spots you can reach to us as well. And I want to say thank you to. David and Amy, they just joined our Patreon page. We get a couple of episodes out every month. We're going to get you one out very soon. We need to plan on that. (laughs) Yes, we do. And I want to thank some people who left us positive reviews on iTunes. Thank you. (laughs) To Danny, your mom, A Good Day, Paper Doll, Gilmore Lynn, and with his origin? Original? Hmm. I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much for leaving five stars. It really helps us kind of combat the douchebags that like to yes. call us airheads, which is fine. I laugh. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. I'm Moronic the life of airheads. Yeah. It's our it, new band. You know what? It actually made me sad, Sonia, because you and I co-host a show called Dorking Out, and I would love to talk about the movie Airheads starring Brendan Fraser yes. and Steve Buscemi, one of my favorites, but it is not streaming. Whoever Release you are. It. Release it, you cowards. Release it, you cowards. Release airheads and pump up the volume. What is wrong with you people? We need this in our lives now more than ever. So do you want to tell them about the website really quick? Yes, you can go to whatacreeppodcast.com and you can find everything you ever wanted to know about our show, but we're afraid to ask. There are links to all of our episodes, the Patreon page and our merch shop where you could get tote bags and t-shirts and face masks all the things with our logo on it and uh they're great the shirts are comfortable the masks are wonderful do it you won't be sorry i have my maybe next year shirt right now that is awesome i wear it jennifer beale style i cut it all up yeah i you know when i made that shirt i was like well, you know, we could wear it in 2020, but after that, it probably won't be very useful. Little did I know. <laughs> so naive. <laughs> Still works. Send us pictures if you buy any gear, if you want, if that's okay. We do have also, if you join the Patreon page, we have a newsletter that goes out and we'll include pictures of y'all in your gear. Please. Yes. And... We're going to dive right in. We might have to take a quick break so Sonia can pick up Calvin at the bus stop. <laughs> Adorable Calvin. Adorable. Everybody, Everybody drink. drink. Okay. Are we ready? Oy. Are you ready, Sonia? Oh, yes, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was like, oh shit, what happened to her? <laughs> Just got started. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Jeffrey McDonald was convicted in 1979 of murdering his wife and two daughters. On the night of February 17th, 1970, at the time he was a doctor for the United States Air Force. His wife was expecting their third trial, third trial, their third child, a son. And he's been through many trials, you'll find out. And he mm-hmm. told his wife that he wanted to live in Russia for a few months to work on the boxing team. When Mm. she was pregnant. (laughs) Six months pregnant. Yeah. They had an argument heard by the neighbors on February 16th or 17th. And then later he called the police saying that he and his wife Colette were attacked by a group of hippies and to please come to their place right away. The next 10 years of this story... Actually, it's more like 50, really. Mm -hmm. It's a whirlwind of activity with a cast of characters that are almost too nutty to be the truth. This is one of the most talked about true crime stories in U.S. history. It's got all kinds of things here, uh, but trigger warnings, murder, domestic violence, and family annihilator. If those are triggering for you, you may want to listen to another show, maybe, yeah. you know, about Errol Flynn and about his penis. <laughs> Look- <laughs> That's a whole story. If you haven't listened to the Errol Flynn episode... It is comedy gold. You should go back and listen to that it's one. It's the palate cleanser. Yes, this one's going to be tough. Yeah, my sources are Jeffrey McDonald's Wikipedia page, Vanity Fair, Joe McGinnis's Wiki- Wikipedia page, Erica Kelly, Southern Fry True Crime Podcast. She is dope. She did a double episode about this. I put the link Ooh. in the show notes. Yeah, it's, I think it's episodes yeah. 28 and 29. Southern Fried True Crime. She has the most excellent voice ever for podcasting. And she did a great job with this. And she fucking hates his ass, too. So it's kind of fun. Nice. The Jeffrey McDonald case dot com. Turns out there's a few competing people that hate Jeffrey McDonald and have. Dude, all it's the easy, cases. man. It's not it's hard. easy. Yeah. <laughs> The documentary Wilderness of Error that was on FX that's streaming on Hulu right now. It might be on Amazon and other parts of the world. Oxygen's story about Freddie Kassab. He was the stepfather of Colette. Mm-hmm. And Joe McInnes's book, Final Vision, The Last Word on Jeffrey McDonald. It's one of the last things he wrote before he passed away. I also want to say, just this is strictly from my memory, but the TV movie Fatal Vision, which was on NBC for two nights in 1984 and played for about 20 plus years on Lifetime on a loop. Yes. And it is currently the full movie is on YouTube with commercials, which is always the best, which is amazing. Yes. So enjoy. Let's get into it. Jeffrey Robert McDonald was born October 12th, 1943. He is from New York City originally and then lived in Long Island. He had kind of a tough disciplinarian father. He was very good looking, very charming. He did very well. And he was he met Colette Stevenson when they were both in high school, high school, excuse me, Patchogue High School, which is out in Long Island. Colette is from a very interesting background. Her father passed away when she was young, and then her mom got remarried. Mildred married Freddie Kassab. Freddie Kassab is very interesting because, first of all, he's Canadian, and he was in the Canadian Army Intelligence Operator during World War II. He had lost his wife and daughter in a bombing of London during the Blitz. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. After the war, he came to America in the 50s. He married Mildred, who had two kids, and he became their stepdad and loved being a stepdad and was mm-hmm. and just was very, very close to Colette. Jeffrey goes to Princeton. He gets a scholarship. He's a football player, goes to Princeton, and then he goes to medical school. He joins the Air Force somewhere in there when Colette's about 20 years old. They're about the same age. She became pregnant, and they got married. So their daughter, Kimberly, was born in 1964, and then Kristen followed along in 1967. They lived in different places, but had settled near Fort Bragg, which is uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Jeffrey was known to be very charismatic. He was an emergency room doctor. Everybody just kind of, like, 
thought he was kind of the golden boy. Like I said, he mm. was handsome. He was very confident. You, you have to have like confidence in order to be a doctor, I think, especially True. an emergency room doctor. If you're like, you, if you're like me and you question yourself quite often, it's not a good job to have. When when you describe him as good looking, do you mean he was actually good looking yes. or do you mean like Ted Bundy? No, I think looking. he's actually to me he's actually <laughs> handsome. He's yeah. not yeah, I think he could be a, a, a GQ model. Yeah, in the 70s. And he's actually smart, not Ted Bundy smart. No, he's actually he's very smart. I mean, if you look at his beautiful like big blue eyes, he's got a mm-hmm. good smile. I mean, he's yeah, he's way better looking than Ted Bundy. Yeah, and he and he went to Princeton. He's actually smart. He's educated. Uh, yeah, Ted Bundy's just totally mediocre in every way whatsoever, and yet portrayed as some suave, handsome genius, which is what we and he, we talked about before. Is, yeah, yes, we we talked about him in a past episode. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. he and Colette had a volatile relationship he didn't say that to their families but they would he fucked around on her quite a bit he had a my thing. favorite uh, yeah <laughs> it, it, there's this one story he was seeing he, he would he would screw with the nurses of course he was uh, mm-hmm. secretaries on the site. He also screwed family friends like his his friends wives. And there's a case where a woman named Marion Stern, he would say to Colette, he's in the Air Force. He's oh, I've got to go to a training for a few weeks. I'll be right back. And then he would take off with these women. He had a girlfriend in New York at this time. What a piece of shit. He really was juggling a lot of babes. Yeah. This woman, Marion, he not only was stooping Marion, he was also sleeping with her daughter, Nina, who <gasps> was 22 at the time, and then later admitted oh, to sleeping with her other sister, who was 16. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, this guy sucks. So he completely sucks. He's 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 living a double life. He's on one hand, he's acting one way on at home. When he's alone with Colette, he's got a volatile temper. They mm. get into big yelling, screaming matches. She told her sister in law that uh, that she was sick of this. He was he's in a bad mood all the time. He's never home. When he is home, he's grouchy. He's not a good father. He's you know, working for the army. He's not making a lot of money. Right. He's not even 30 years old. He's like 26. One night, he says, 1970, February 17th, he's sleeping on the couch because his daughter, Kimberly, I believe, had peed in the bed, in her parents' bed. And she had Mm. a bedwetting problem. So he put her to bed and he said, I'm just going to sleep on the couch and I'll clean this up tomorrow. He says, oh my God. I woke up in the middle of the night and there were these four hippies in my apartment and they're standing over. These hippies are standing over me and there's, it's two white guys, a black guy, and there's a woman with a white floppy hat. She's, she's Caucasian. She's white. She, and she's got a hippie ish look about her long blonde hair, go, go boots. And they're saying things like acid is groovy and kill the pigs. Mm hmm. He calls for help. He says they attack him. That's what he remembers. He goes upstairs. He sees that his wife is injured. He tries to take care of her, and then he passes out. He wakes up, he says, and he calls for help. And the MPs come over first, military police. Yes. Completely freaked out. They don't know what they're walking into. No, this is not something they normally they probably usually walk into domestic violence situations. That's usually it. Is. And, and right? that happens a lot in these military bases, by the way. These these guys coming home from Vietnam, we're seeing it now. Mm-hmm. If you know, if there's if there's not domestic violence, there's there's death by suicide that's going up in record numbers. It was it, it's not you think I think you would be completely safe on a military base. Turns out no. Right. And uh, he, the military police look at him and he says, oh, my wife and kids have been stabbed. I tried to stop it. Oh, and also I might be going into shock soon. If that happens, just elevate my legs. And Hmm. they're like, "Uh, okay. And look, it's 1970. It's not like, you know, Gil is going to show up from CSI (laughs) and hazmat the place up. 
military, the MPs are going in and out of the apartment. The ambulance drivers going in and out of the apartment. It was a cold, cold, rainy night. It's just mud, you know, from them going up and down the stairs. It turns out Jeffrey, his wife and his two daughters, they each had different blood types. Do you know your blood type, by the way? I don't. (gasps) I'm always shocked when people say that. And here's the thing. I, I, I did know at some point I have just forgotten. Wow. That's all like, but considering all the things I've been through. Yeah. I think true. that I would know this off the top of my head. I don't. <laughs> I'm O negative by the way. Okay. That's good to know. Good to, you know, just in case if I pass out here. Yes. Tell them to race my legs if I'm in shock. <laughs> Mine is um, red. It's red. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> They, the police find that Colette and the girls have been murdered. They've been beaten and stabbed to death. Jeffrey is the first suspect because he's there. And he has a puncture wound in his chest and a collapsed lung. Goes to the hospital. Not not suspicious at all. Not even in the slightest. They look around and, oh, also... The word pig was written in blood on their headboard by his wife in her blood. Right. And the MPs don't know what to do at first. It's new for everybody. There hadn't been a murder there in a really long time. And they're just trying to figure out who did this. And Jeff has said, there are these crazed hippies. And it wasn't that crazy to consider in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which is the big town nearby. A lot of former Marines were hanging out there. It's 1970. Drugs are everywhere. It's speed. It's heroin. It's, it's things that change people's demeanor. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's things that people get addicted to very quickly and then get desperate. So there, the press is at first like, well, this guy is a, a, you know, a green beret and he's a doctor. He's, it's poor man. It's something had happened to him. There must have been these hippies. So this is in February. By about May, June, nothing's really happening. And Freddie Kassab and Mildred are like, hey, who's on top of this? What's going on here? And Jeff never really seemed to be pushing in the direction of we need to solve what's happening here. He's more about, hey, can I please... Discharge. Discharge. Thank you. Honorably yeah. discharge because I need to start my life over. And this is around March or April. And yeah. they, they let him go. He yeah. sells all of his family things in a garage sale. His Yeah, his, his family's been murdered. And he's like, yeah, I need to move on now. I need a change of scenery. It, it, it's been a couple weeks, so yeah. I just need to move on. I need to move on. He admits, by the way, that he was stooping one of the secretaries at the base during this time, right after his family was murdered. Cool. He moves to Long Beach, California, and changes his life. He Mm -hmm. works for a fancy hospital. He gets a fancy car. He has a yacht. He has a condo. He's free to date. I'm using a polite verb there. As much as he likes. And... No one can and, tell and, me the yacht's name was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. No, please. We're, I want to hear it. No, I was going to say the yacht's name was like definitely not a murderer. <laughs> not me. <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> not a killer. It's, no, it was the hippies. <laughs> <laughs> he says this story over and over again. There are these hippies. They came in. It was a girl with a floppy hat. And there mm-hmm. is one one of the CID officers that said, "Oh, I saw a woman that looked like somebody I know that there that night." And it was like three in the it was three a.m. when this happened. So it's unusual to see a woman in a white outfit would stick out because you shouldn't wear that after Labor Day. But <laughs> just kidding. Also, it was raining. It was raining. He said he saw her. You could see lots of people. I it, mm-hmm. yeah. Jeffrey moves to L.A. and Freddie is calling all the time saying, dude, what's going on? Are they investigating your case? Nobody will answer my calls. Freddie is the most persistent person. Yeah, he is. <laughs> well, if I, I want somebody like him. Mm-hmm. He, 
he, he was not going to let go. He wanted answers, and he didn't feel like Jeffrey was really working hard to find out who had done this to his family. Yes. And his father-in-law starts calling all the time. And his father-in-law was a, a phone salesman. He worked for an egg company, and he would make deals like with grocery stores and stuff like that. Chatty guy. He was just always on the phone. He recorded every single conversation. Every conversation. So, so interesting. It, it, everything. And Jeff started saying things like, hey, Freddie, guess what I'm doing? I'm going to Baltimore because I heard one of the hippies that killed my family is in Baltimore. I'm going to rough them up. I'll let you know how it goes. And then he'd call back and say, hey, Freddie, guess what? I killed one of them. I beat the shit out of this guy. And I'm pretty sure he's dead. I, on record. He, yes. I'm paraphrasing, but he's saying he's he's telling his father-in-law, I killed the people that killed one of the people that killed your daughter and your granddaughters. Are we good now? Uh, I'm going to go yeah, back and, to <laughs> the Regal Beagle. Course, <laughs> the Regal Beagle. And of course, these things didn't happen because no. much like OJ, you know, on his supposed search for the real killers, that was not happening. No, he was he was fucking around. Freddie mm -hmm. is getting more and more upset. What's also happening around this time, we have to say, with 1970, in May of 1970, there's a thing that happens called Kent State, where at Kent State University, there was a peaceful protest that was interrupted by the military, and the military were given orders to shoot that unarmed is... kids. It's so fucked up. It is one of the most fucked up stories. Yes. So, so the MPs were not exactly, and the military in general wasn't exactly in the mood to be like going out and going after one of their own, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So they weren't, they kind of needed a, lot, a fire lit under their ass. And Freddie Kassab was just the man to do it. He had the matches. <laughs> he had the matches. <laughs> He had addresses. He was good with talking. He got the name of every single senator and congressman in the United States. I don't mean in New York. Right. I mean every single one in total. And he wrote a letter and he delivered it personally to every single one. And then he followed up with a phone call and said... And then they all bought eggs. <laughs> <laughs> And the egg salad parties were insane. <laughs> I love good egg Sales salad. Sales went through the roof. <laughs> he knew what he was fucking doing. Jeffrey was getting kind of annoyed. Why is this guy, why is he just like breathing down their necks? What, you know, because everybody's like, look, I'm going around D.C. I'm like hounding every person I've ever known in my entire life, you know, from my military connections. What are you doing to figure this out? And Jeffrey's like, I got it. I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to go on the Dick Cavett show. That'll fix it. That'll fix everything. And I'm going to write my book if I did it <laughs> and promote it on Dick Cavett. <laughs> Fucking asshole. He goes on Dick Cavett and my favorite story, and I don't know if this is in that or not, or if it's on, there's like an accompanying, there's a podcast that accompanies, I have the link in the show notes for Wilderness of Error. And uh, it, the Mark Smerling is the director and the executive producer. He did the Jinx, uh, mm -hmm. capturing the Freedmen's, and uh, he goes on Dick Cavett's show. And just what at the, happened at the time, Dick Cavett would have producers kind of mind a guest for the day before they went on the show, just to make them sure they don't drink too much, or if they do, if they give him some juicy gossip that he can then have Dick ask them on the show. They had to kind of shadow the person. And it was this woman and she's hanging out with Jeffrey all day. And then she brings him onto the set. And as he's walking onto the set, she mouths the words to Dick Cavett. I think he did it. <laughs> Cause he did. Cause he's a fucking murderer. And he goes on there and this is December of 1970. And he proceeds to just rail against the army and what didn't come poops they were. And how they couldn't, you know, they, they made so many errors. They're so fucking stupid. It, like, he's such a victim of their incompetence. Not a victim of losing his family. No. He doesn't mention them. Like, doesn't bring him up. It's all about how he's inconvenienced by their... Because he's also... he's The guy's got a lot of hubris. Okay, he's very yes. confident. And so... 
he's he's saying all this stuff and it's and the people at home are watching this and uh, colette's family and they're like what the fuck he hasn't been helping at all Mm -mm. what is going on here and freddie and the and the army and the and the uh and the military lawyers were like well fuck now we have to really kind of barrel down what are we going to do and so they called an article 32 where they bring jeffrey in and they go through all their evidence now the army made a fuck ton of errors. The military police, like I said, there were a couple of dozen people that went in and out of that apartment. They did not seal it off the crime scene that uh, one of the one of the victims had uh, skin under her fingernails and they lost that piece of evidence. Yeah, they lost Jeffrey's pajama bottoms that he was wearing and the ambulance driver stole Jeffrey's wallet. Oh, shit. <laughs> Like, <laughs> and of course, that's the part Jeffrey's upset about, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, to this day. I had yeah, to call all those credit cards. I had to cancel them and then do them all over again. My, fa- my family, hmm, I really want that wallet back. It's, it's a lot of incompetence. It's hard to yeah. own up to that. I always say, like, before CSI, how did anybody solve a crime? Seriously. It's just, it, yeah, it just, the, the standards were just very, very different. The government starts to collect their evidence and they make a case for Jeffrey, but they don't think they have enough at that moment. It's like 1971-ish to convict him. So they let it go. And Jeffrey thinks, oh, hey, you know, no double jeopardy here. Like, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Freddie Kassab is fucking furious. And he just stays on them and on them and on them. And finally, he gets in North Carolina attorneys and city folks that are interested in taking on the case. And at first, his lawyer is saying, well, it's been so many years now. You're supposed to get a fast and speedy trial here in America, taking five years and goes through all these courts. And then finally, 1979, all those... Everything is just put to the side. They're like, no, 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 dude. You have to, we're going to try him. It's okay to take a few years to gather evidence. You know, especially for murder. They need yes. to be. He goes to trial in 1979. And just before, he was getting, he was trying to get his public persona, raise his image. He was really obsessed with being in the press. He had notebooks he would write to his lawyers all the time and say things like hey i noticed on the news yesterday that three camera crews came when you were announcing this the uh, the front page of the lifestyle section wrote this about me and they're just constantly loves press <sighs> he writes letters to editors and chiefs of major magazines and says things like i think i would make a great story and profile for your magazine he, Ew. he just is actively seeking press. Oh, he's so gross. He's so... No, he hadn't been convicted of anything at this point. Mm-hmm. But people are like, well, who fucking did it then? It's, I mean, it's the no, gr- he he was thinking he's getting away with it. So now he's he wants... To bank it. it. Yes, exactly. He calls first Joseph Wamba, who was a former L.A. Uh, investigator worked for the LAPD. He wrote The Onion Field, which is a really bummer of a movie. And yeah, it is. It's, he says to him, I think I would make for a great book. You should hang out with me. You know, I'm going to have this trial coming up. Why, why don't we do it? And Wamba was like, fuck no. I'm not <laughs> falling for this. You're guilty. I, I hope that's a direct quote. Fuck no. Fuck no. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, Joe McGinnis said yes. Joe McInnes was a writer who, at the age of 26, had a New York Times bestseller called The Selling of the President. He was embedded, basically, in the Nixon campaign, and he got to know everybody there. And then after Nixon was elected, he put out this book, and it was basically explosive for Mm -hmm. the time. He'd written a few things after that, but he was kind of looking for that next story, and he needed that next book the next big book and he kind of liked Jeffrey he thought Jeffrey seemed like an okay guy and he takes the call he takes the meeting he's flattered that Jeffrey knows who he is and that wants to work with him and they come up with a deal 
he will live with Jeffrey and his attorneys in North Carolina. And he'll be there at the trial every single day. Whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. And Joe McGinnis goes for it. Midway through the trial, Joe McGinnis is like, oh, fuck, this guy is so fucking guilty. He cannot... (laughs) Yeah, because he's guilty. Cause he's fucking guilty. He's so guilty. He's like, yeah, the, I mean, uh, there's so much evidence for, for Christ's sakes. I mean, the fact that the blood on the wall the, pit that says pig, dude. that doesn't have, it didn't have fingerprints. The yeah. only way you could do it was with the surgical glove. Yes. So these Which crazy hippies. Yeah. And these yeah. hippies, by the way, supposedly came into their home and used all their stuff to kill people. They didn't have their own shit with them. Yes. He had drugs on him in his house. He was apparently he, he was taking drugs himself to like stay up nights. He was taking some yes. kind of upper speed. Let's say caffeine pills. But he had a closet full of that. He had money. Didn't take that. But they took his ice pick and they took his bat out of his home and then beat all these people, but left him okay. Right. And the the blood don't lie. The blood like, don't lie, y'all. It's pretty obvious. Like when they go through, because like Margot said, everyone in the house had different blood types. So when they tracked like where the blood was in the house, it doesn't jive with his story. At and all. It, in no way does it. And it's pretty... It's just so obvious. Just the story is, it's just so phony to me. And yeah, you don't buy it. Not even for a second. I, I mean, maybe because I watched Fatal Vision. So <laughs> maybe I wouldn't buy it. But I, I don't even know how you would buy it back then, to be honest. Like, it seems so, so obvious. It, it Yeah. And let me be clear. It, You're not guaranteed justice in our legal system. You're guaranteed due process. He was given due process. He was given every chance, and he's been given every chance since then. Yes. Spoiler. Marco. Yeah. uh, Calvin. Sorry, Calvin's bus is here. Okay. So. Okay. Okay, guys, hang on. All right. He was convicted of second degree murder of Colette and Kimberly because they think he hit her and then he might have hit Kimberly by accident. But Hmm. then um, Kristen was, he just decided she was just a baby. Um, It's so awful. Yeah. So that was first degree murder. And he was given life sentence for each and every one of them. And it was shocking. There were people that, because they did bring a witness and that witness was Helena Stokely. And if you follow this case at all, the woman in the floppy hat, nobody seems to give a shit about any of the men that were there. She was like the Right? Main... I was I... wondering the same thing. I'm like, why don't they ever talk about them? Like, no, no, no. It's just this woman in a floppy hat. And supposedly one military police guy said he saw her that night, but they wouldn't let him that say that he saw her. And then there's people that said, well, she... this woman had a... I don't know if you saw the entire documentary. Yeah. Yeah. She had a sad life. And yeah, and she had all kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. She had problems with drugs. She had problems with mental health issues. She was 17 years old when all this happened. Yeah. And it, th- she was brought in. She was an informant in order to make some money. And there were cops that kind of used her over the years. And they would bring her out. And she'd say, no, I didn't see anything. And then she'd tell people, oh, yeah, I was there. And I this happened. I'm, I'm telling you, somebody who had addicts in her family, they tell fanciful tales mm-hmm. for no fucking reason. And you would think, like, why would you even admit to something like that? It's just, it's just bullshit sometimes. It's just telling yeah. tales. And she, or they think they and did she would, there. Yeah. And she would literally say, like, I was there. And then in the next breath, say, I wasn't there. Like, right. that is not a sane person. It's, that is a person with a lot of problems who is obviously lying. Or just, or just I, I think, maybe just somebody that, like, doesn't have a firm grasp of the truth. You know, it, yes. it, that the truth is a fluctuating thing for her. 
depending yeah. on her sobriety. And your memories are never what you really think they are. Your memory is always memories of a memory, you know, and then you put drugs mm-hmm. with that and chemical changes in your brain. It's just not like, that's just not the witness. I'm going mean, to I'll listen to the testimony, but I'm not going to think like, well, but all hinges on her. And she was a big, it was, it was enough that they thought that would create doubt, but it mm-hmm. didn't. He was convicted. And then to put, salt in the wounds he was completely shocked and of course that he was but he was immediately going to appeal it and bernie siegel it was as tough as nails lawyer very he had like this crazy like bald head and big white hair you know on the sides Mm -hmm. and sideburns he was from philadelphia some people thought maybe because he's this east coast guy coming to the south maybe that worked against him who knows jeffrey's in jail He's fighting it. And Joe McGinnis was th- went through the trial. And he and Jeffrey are like, they're going to write this. Joe's like, okay, I got to write this book. You've got to give me as much information as you possibly can about every aspect of your life. And Jeffrey's a total narcissist. So he's like, yay, mm-hmm. of course. And starts- I love to talk about me. <laughs> he fills up 32 cassettes full of him just talking. And he blabs mm-hmm. and blabs and blabs. He admits to sleeping around on his wife. He thinks the media is stupid. He like insults people. And then he, then he tells them that they're his friend. He feels sorry for himself. And McGinnis is like, keep going, keep going. Just write this down. Mm-hmm. And I love this part. When the book is released, he, um, Mike Wallace is interviewing Jeffrey McDonald on 60 Minutes. And it's like the exclusive. They get to break the story. And, and he, in 60 Minutes, talks to Jeffrey. And they're like, hey, did you hear that Joe McGinnis thinks you're guilty? And he sits there he's like, huh? Because <laughs> huh? he, he didn't have editorial control. He had mm-hmm. no idea what the book even looked like. And, and Joe McGinnis was always like, no, nah, no, nah, I'll show you soon. I'll show you soon. It becomes this huge bestseller. Jeffrey McDonald, they, he, and, and Joe McGinnis lays it out like this is exactly what happened. He's been lying for mm-hmm. years. He wanted to be what we now call a family annihilator, which, you know, th- and yes. there's been a few of those in the news the last few years. That's mm-hmm. what it's like a textbook case of it. It's a guy who's like, once again, he's like 26 years old, two kids, one more on the way. He wants to sleep around, tired of working for pennies, thinks he, you know, he's entitled. He thinks he should have a bigger, better life. And just snaps. Yeah, that's the uh, the documentary, the American Family mm-hmm. one, the one with Chris Chris Watts. It's yes, just like that story just made the rounds like last year. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's yeah. Fuck it's just, these people. Yeah, fuck them. And McGinnis then has the TV series where Gary Cole plays Jeffrey McDonald. Jeffrey's yes. not in too into that performance. He prefer it was Robert Redford, but whatever. Of course, of course he would. And Jeffrey McDonald is one of those people that because he was good looking, he probably he had a lot of privilege and he was able to skate by on that. And he was allowed able to charm a lot of people and get them to think what he wants them to think. And he tried to do that to Joe McGinnis and it didn't work. And he was probably very shocked. He was completely that he wasn't able to trick him. Yeah, he was completely yeah. blindsided. And then it, it, it's the TV movie comes out. Even Marie Saint, Andy Griffith, no, no, Carl Malden, excuse me, Carl Malden. Carl Malden, yeah. Who's great as Freddie Kassab. Uh, Colette's mm-hmm. brother said it was a very accurate portrayal, like perfect. Everything from there's this great scene in the, in the TV movie where the pajama top. So Jeff was wearing a pajama top. He says that he was fighting off. You know, he wrapped it around his yes. hands and like a shield. He made a shield of this pajama top and the hippie was just like stabbing at him and stabbing at him. Oh, yeah. See, Max is like bullshit. Yeah. Max <laughs> knows what's up. He's all this is bullshit. I'm out of here. And then in the movie, they show that the prick holes of it, the uh, it was from an ice pick and it was like completely in line with the injuries that Colette had on her. It's it, so awful. Yeah. He just wrapped it and just stabbed her and then. Yeah. Okay. He sues Joe McGinnis for fraud. Says, look, we had a deal. You reneged on it. They're going back and forth and back and forth. Joe McGinnis writes a few more different. There's fatal vision. There's uh, there's cruel doubt. There's I read that faith. one. I, re- I loved cruel doubt. That was a good one. Yeah. That's a banana yeah. story. We should do it's that someday. so bananas. 
And we totally should. And that's got a, a crazy TV movie as well. With Gwyneth Paltrow. Yes. Yes. And her mother. And her mother, yes. Yeah, that's a good one. In 1990, there is, I'm sorry, in 1989, Janet Malcolm of The New Yorker writes a story and it's called The Journalist and the Murderer. And she's basically talking about fatal vision. The thing with reporters is that they have to lie to people in order to get the story. Mm -hmm. And some reporters feel bad about it and some of them don't. And there's different levels of scumminess to it. it. For some reason, it just was like this huge, like, what? It, it was a book that's a bestseller. It's still taught in colleges. But she completely raked him over the coals, Jeff, Joe McGinnis. That he should Dude, fuck that. I know, I know. She's just like, oh, he lied and he was using his, you know, everything... It basically was giving Jeffrey McDonald a little bit of backing for what he was complaining about. They sued, he lost, and then they sued again. And then uh, Freddie Kassab was suing Jeffrey McDonald. There was like a few hundred thousand dollars on the table for that needed to be sorted out. And Jeffrey McDonald wanted that money. And then Freddie Kassab wanted that money. And Joe McGinnis says, no, that's my money. It's going all around. Basically, J Joe McGinnis settled. Because at some point, mm -hmm. sometimes it's just easier versus paying lawyers, which yeah. will cost you two, three times as much. Right. And Freddie and Mildred got a little bit of that. Freddie and Mildred were very, you know, they were on the Jeffrey McDonald train and then they were completely off that train and they never, mm -hmm. ever stopped. And they, these poor people had to talk about this every year on the anniversaries Every time Jeff and Matt, Jeffrey McDonald has tried to appeal this case yes. so many times in the last 40 years, so many times. And it's a crazy twist is in 2001, Errol Morris on Christmas morning, he's visiting, he's with his wife and he's visiting his family in North Carolina. And he became friends with one of Jeffrey's attorneys and Errol Morris wrote, uh, sorry, directed a movie called The Thin Blue Line, where there was a man that was on death row in Texas. And this film changed everything. This guy was mm -hmm. going to be uh, going to be executed. And he was innocent. Yes, yeah, it's a it's a really good documentary. It really is. And at the time, it was a big deal. I remember this, that the press talking mm -hmm. about like, well, I'll do all these reenactments. And is that really mm -hmm. a documentary? Isn't this more of a documentary that versus that? And Errol Morris is like, fuck that. I'm going to make it exciting. I'm going to make it interesting. Because it, it did. He made these exciting documentaries. He decides on Christmas morning, 2001, let's go visit that, the death site, you know, where Jeffrey McDonald killed his family. And she's like, all right. Because she's <laughs> sounds sounds like a great Christmas activity. <laughs> sounds like they're made for each other. And yeah. they, they go and he decides it's ludicrous. This man is innocent. He couldn't possibly have done it the way that it's been said said before and that they came his mission and he'd done a lot of documentaries since then but this was always in the back burner and he wanted to make his movie about it about the jeffrey mcdonald murders was convinced that he was innocent he eventually wrote a book because he couldn't sell a movie and the book was called wilderness of error released in 2012 so it's like 11 years after he started so he was yes. really into it and he literally doesn't come with any new evidence. Nothing. No. It's all the same shit. Too many people were in and out of that house. Helena Stokely had admitted that she was the one that was there. It's just, it's the same shit over and over again. It gets a lot of press at the time and some very good reviews. I was kind of shocked, but I, you know, I, I was going to tell you that I didn't read it. But I think the fucker is guilty, so I don't have, you know. Confirmation bias, I think he, maybe that's it. I'm like, I think he's super guilty, and there was nothing in that documentary that made me no. not even for a second think that he wasn't guilty well, or that he was innocent. Right. Well, there's a certain type of interviewing that he does, and he created this camera angle where basically the subject is just staring into the camera and talking. It's as if that person mm -hmm. is talking to you, and he developed that. And he got people... Robert S. McNamara. Yes, he got him to basically admit that the Vietnam War yes. was a total fucking waste of time. He had Donald Rumsfeld on there. He didn't talk as much. He, that's his, the other thing with Elizabeth Holmes. He did, he did commercials. He had one with her. Yes. 
tubes and tubes right. of blood. <laughs> Love it. So Mark Smerling did The Jinx, which is one of my favorite documentaries. It was on oh HBO. Oh, my God. So good. Capturing the Freedmans. So good. I mean, so good. Bummers, but. <laughs> yeah. He is kind of, he goes to Blumhouse and Blumhouse does all these like horror movies, kind of mm-hmm. splatter movies and thrillers and stuff. This is one of their first documentaries and they make a deal with FX and it was four or five episodes and they really go into deep, deep, deep into the weeds of what ex- they got everybody that's still alive and got them to talk about this case. And there's no new evidence. Mm-mm. And there's actually a piece of film that shows Helena Stokely doing a TV interview and saying, I'll kind of say whatever you want, whatever, you know. Yeah. What's going to get me paid? Yeah, she's not in her right mind. Not in her right mind. She just wasn't, yeah. They were taking advantage of her. She was being manipulated by people. And at the very, very end, Mark Smerling's asking him, Errol Morris, so what do you think? What do you think? And Errol Morris, completely irritated, you could tell. Yeah. Says, well... I still think he's innocent, but I don't think he's as innocent as I thought before. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, it's shades of gray. Oh. <laughs> he's, 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 uh, whatever, Errol Morris. <laughs> yeah. LOL. I mean, you know. anyway, that was Jeffrey and his wife, who, by the way, would go on every show. He's been married for 20 years. You what can find somebody. Uh, you know what? there's someone for every pot there's a lid he's been married to this woman <laughs> for 20 years that's what my aunt used to say yeah he's mm-hmm. been married for 20 years she would go on larry king she would go on all the shows and just i mean everyone there's people who are on jeffrey's side are just super indignant that anything happened to him and i get it if you really think it was an injustice it's i get that but not this guy no, and, and this is the same, like a Scott Peterson, too. Like, right. he, he has his, like, f- almost like fans, his yeah. fans that, like, go to bat for him. And, like, anytime you read a story, there's people in the comments or tweeting that's like, he's so innocent. I'm like, whatever. Well, it's like, like Erica Jane on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. It just acts right. like a total asshole. And you're like, oh, she's a queen. Leave her alone. It doesn't matter uh. to you. I know. That's the, that's the worst arguing. This past year, so Jeffrey and his wife didn't participate. They did sign up. They were going to do an interview, and then they canceled it at the last minute. Jeffrey apparently is, he's 77 years old now. He's not doing great. He's going to need dialysis soon. He has a lot of health issues, and he was applying first to be let out of jail because of COVID. And now it's more, uh, just a few months ago, it was more of just sort of compassionate leave, like he's He's saying he's on his last legs, like Bill Cosby, who then like danced out of jail yeah. the second he was like, yeah, no, fuck Jeffrey McDonald. Yeah. He deserves to die in prison. He's still there as of this recording. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our creep this week. Jeffrey McDonald. Good job, Margot. Thank he's you. He's a monster. He is a fucking monster. And it's it's so upsetting. And I'm glad he's in jail. And I'm I'm shocked yeah, he's still there because of all the people that I mean, he had a lot of people for a while there riding that wave of like, oh no, he's innocent. Yeah. I'm surprised he hasn't been murdered in prison. Uh they don't like people who kill kids. No, no. A lot of people don't like people that kill kids. That's true. That's you know and we're not encouraging anything. <laughs> no. No, by the way. No, I'm not. When it comes to stories like this, I can never get past that his children knew he was doing this. Yeah. That's the part that like sits with me. Like when I watch the documentary again, what sits with me is his kids knew their dad was doing this to them. They must have been so terrified. Exactly. And it breaks my heart. And this is our children depend on us to, to take care of them and when we fail them like that and when we when someone does something like that it just it just it's like a punch in the fucking gut and i just hate this dude and i i hope he never gets out of prison and i hope he just fucking rots i hate his guts i don't know if i'm making it clear (laughs) i hate his guts okay what was that again do you like him or do you not believe him? i don't like him very much he sucks for good and sufficient reason yeah. So for our not a creep, mm. I was thinking about 
Jeffrey McDonald murdered his family at Fort Bragg. And then I just started thinking about soldiers and with everything that's going on in Afghanistan and a lot of United States, like our troops are coming home. And I was thinking that maybe there was a couple of ways, there's a couple of organizations out there that are not creeps. And I was thinking there are ways that maybe we could all be the not a creep and help some of these people. I put together a little list of organizations that I think are worthy. Well, there's a million organizations that are worthy, but here's the ones that I found that I like the best. There's one, it's a nonprofit and it's called Soldier's Best Friend. And it pairs veterans with dogs oh. that they adopted from a local shelter. And they help these veterans live and train the dog. They teach them like basic obedience and how to behave in public and and specific tasks to help this veteran if they have post-traumatic stress disorder. Once the dogs are fully trained, they are now qualified to be like service dogs or like therapeutic companion dogs, emotional support animals, so they can like bring them places. And I'll send you the links, Margo, so we can put them in the show notes. Mm -hmm. You can like donate money if you want, but they also have like an Amazon wish list. So Mm -hmm. you could like, if you're just shopping on Amazon and you want to like throw a dog bed in there or something, you can. It's like a really easy way. Yeah, a really easy way to support. There's another one that's like, you know, I, I we love animals. We're animal people. So there's one called War Horses for Veterans. And it like helps veterans. It connects them with the horses, basically. And it teaches them how to ride horses, teaches them about like grooming and riding. Keep going back to this um a stable I guess Mm -hmm. stable and they can just go there and like ride the horses and they did this study and they found that post-traumatic stress it all dropped it dropped 87 percent for these people for these veterans when they after six weeks of like riding horses like I think that's really cool I was a um I volunteered at a stable when I was a teenager and we helped with people who had um you know you know, leg problems from everything from paralyzed to uh, missing a limb or, or all, uh, any other kind of like injuries. And it was at a rehab hospital that mm-hmm. I was a candy striper. You put people on a horse and their demeanor completely changed. First of all, I think horses are so beautiful, but they are. I've, I've seen it in person. People who just all of a sudden they're, they just, it's it, the light in their eyes when they're just walking, even just in a circle. Yeah. It's so beautiful. We don't yeah, deserve horses. Just, They're so wonderful. We don't. And, you know, that's how I feel about basically all pets. Yes. Yeah. Like, I think there's, it is, there's an amazing feeling when like you connect with an animal. There's just that it's, it's just a special kind of love that you feel for those animals. Cause it's not complicated. Their love for you isn't complicated. It's just such a good thing. And Almost all of these have to do with animals, by the way, because I'm just that person. But there's another one that's called Force Blue. It helps veterans and it connects them with um, marine conservation therapy to former combat divers. And it retrains them and helps them learn how to work on conservation es- efforts and restoration efforts and things like that that and that's another one that you can just donate to a lot of these also have amazon wish lists which i think is a really cool thing yeah and then the last one is there's a motorcycle relief project invites all these veterans to go on like guided motorcycle adventure trips and it just helps them like decompress and they learn new skills and it helps them manage their stress and it connects them with other veterans and helps them like so they have other people to talk to understand what they've been through That's another one that's pretty worthy, I think. And I will send you the links and they're in our show notes. So if you want to donate to one of these, please do. Oh, good job, Sonia. You're so thoughtful. Thank you. Oh, you're very sweet. I just, these, all these people are coming home and they need, they need help. And if you want to help the people of Afghanistan, actually, I'll put a, I'll put a link in there too for the International Rescue um, Committee. There's places that you could donate to there too we're the not a creeps yeah th- that's so good well thank you all so much for listening to this show today if you like the sound of our voices and why the hell wouldn't you i mean really 
we right. co-host a show called Dorking Out. We're doing a series of episodes about movies that are based in Chicago. And Sonia, what are we covering next? It's a movie called Chicago. <laughs> We were like, what should we do next? And you're like, there is a movie called Chicago that we could actually do. So we are going to talk about Chicago. And we haven't talked about a musical in a really long time on Dorking Out, I don't think. So this is going to be really fun. I'm really looking forward to it. And then the week after that, we're going to do Running Scared with Adam Risky from F This Movie. So really good Chicago movies coming your way. Be sure to follow us on all the things. We love it when you use the Annie Potts gif. We got one either on all the social medias for your creeps or your non creep suggestions. And Sonia, where can they find you? You can find me at the Sonia show.com and the Sonia show on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. Where can people find you, Margo? I'm at Brooklyn Fitchick for Twitter and Instagram. My site is brooklynfitchick.com. And you guys, in the meantime, stay cool. <laughs> wear your sunscreen it's hot out there still mm -hmm. drink lots of water be good to each other don't be a creep creep thank you for listening to us talk about creeps you can follow us at what a creep podcast on facebook twitter and instagram but don't follow us too closely you can email us your creepy stories at what a creep podcast at gmail.com but please keep your dick pics to yourself